Hello and welcome to yet another Short Shoot Show. We hope you've been enjoying the show so far. We're up to episode six. Never thought we'd make it this far. My name is Will McCloy and this week I've worked how to do intro music. So let's put that on. Ah, it really gives a sense of urgency to the show. Joining us, the fastest Iron Man on earth, Tim Don is here. Patrick Langer came close last weekend, but not close enough. He still holds the record. Four-time world champion Chris McCormack is here again because everything I do, I do with him for some reason. And despite all of her barb comments last week, Annie Emerson is back again because somehow she's contracted to do that. I don't know why. And our special guest this week is Christian Blumenfeld because he wins a lot of races. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the show. Maka, let's start with you. What have you been doing? You look cold. You look, um, but you look happy up there at the top of your house in the loft. How are you? I'm all good. It is cold. It's very cold in Sydney. We're at under 20 degrees, so winter's definitely on the way. But good weekend. It's good to be back with the gang, chatting triathlon after a heavy weekend of racing. Christian does win a lot, but he didn't win on the weekend. Well, he didn't win on the weekend. That's very true. Disappointing yeah. seventh for Christian just because he races every single week. Uh, it's under 20, so it's winter in Sydney, and it's under 20, so it's summer in Europe. And uh, congratulations for making it this far, Tim Donis. Playing havoc with your hair, all that humidity up there, though. You look a little bit like Kramer. How are you? <laughs> I'm good, thanks. Um, yeah, no, we need more humidity. Then it will just flatten down. Um, <laughs> yeah, as you said, summer's on the way. Um, the wettest May, May ever which is always a pleasure um, in England because the rain is always cold here. But, yeah, no, looking forward to some spring-like summer weather. It's nearly hit 20 degrees up in the East Midlands. Um, yeah, let's hope it warms up for Leeds next weekend. It won't. And it's 50% chance of rain as well. <laughs> <laughs> Annie, how are you? Welcome back to the show. Are you going to be kinder to me this I'm week I'm going to be not? really kind to you, Well, I did, I did think I was a bit mean, and I think I need to get a grip of it. So um, as I've already told you, I crashed yesterday going uphill on my bike. So I'm the idiot of the week on this show, that's for sure. Uh, but all good. No, the sun is shining. And um, yeah, I think we were a bit hotter down here in, in Surrey, about 22 degrees. But all good, all happy and very happy to be chatting with you guys, all things uh, triathlon this morning. Yeah, this is the, this is the twenty thousand pound bike we've heard so much about that's in the back of the shot all the time, but now it's missing, and I feel good about it. What happened? I don't know. I think the derailleur sort of rammed in the back wheel or something, but but it's good. I've, I've got it with a mechanic friend of mine who spent twenty years at McLaren working on the car, so I think he's uh, qualified to work on my well, not quite twenty grand bike, but not far off that. Pinarello, dogma, just to get it in there. <laughs> oh, I can't. oh I can't. this will be the sound for um for name dropping. Right? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'll use. There you go. First one of the day goes to Annie Emerson. Oh, my mate who works for McLaren. Yeah, there it is. There it is. Uh, let's get into it. Another weekend, another World Cup, this time Arzacania. A uh, really tough, windy, steep course in Sardinia. Olympic spots on the line. It's so good. I mean, obviously, we had to wait for racing, but now it's racing every weekend. Um, last, last year, Vincent Lewis and Flora Duffy won. Didn't have a strong women's... Um, field this time uh no u.s women no british women uh no flora duffy uh but there's plenty in the men's and let's start with the men's and what a race from johnny brownlee um after what has been a lean half a decade almost by his standards uh and when you look back he's had an incredibly long and successful career uh he led uh he he had a sprint on the run and did the job and it probably meant a lot to him tim let's start with you how, how good is it to see a countryman of his calibre coming into the Olympics and taking a win? Oh, it's brilliant. I mean, under 10 weeks to go, um, there's a big difference getting on the podium for finishing fourth and winning, and that's what he wants, that's what he needs. So that win will mean a lot to him. It'll give him so much confidence going into Leeds and then a big training block, no doubt. Um, but he's a realist. He knows lots of the big, the big players weren't there, and the course is very unique, and it really suits his strength. But... If you've got a number on, you're in it to win it. So Christian, as you said, he's been winning everything, even first in line at the breakfast buffet. So to beat beat, beat Christian and, and everyone else, he'll be super happy, especially because he did it on the run. It wasn't a small breakaway off the bike. And, um, you know, so his run form is looking really good. Let's just hope he can stay injury free. Maka, what was your take on it? Because this is a guy, you know, you look back to 2011 through or 2010 to 2012, he, he, he didn't miss a podium for 40-something races, you know, and it seems bizarre these days. When you look back at his last five years, he's taken three big wins. He's taken a Beijing try, he won Edmonton in 2019, and he won SLT once in Singapore. 
but he's had some shocking results too mixed in there. So, I mean, how important confidence-wise is this and where has Johnny been for the last five years? Well, it's all relative. I wouldn't call them shocking results. I, I just say the expectations of the Brownleys have been that they're one or two all the time. So post, I guess, Rio, pre-Rio, they were dominant. I think literally post those Rio Olympics, both Alistair and Johnny, it seems that the rest of the field have closed that gap that they used to have over everybody. And that was there was a bit of a, you know, Alistair opting to go long distance halfway during that journey. And, and I felt that Johnny Brownlee missed Alistair because together they were a dynamic duo in a lot of the racing they did. Now, it was a sprint race, the World Cup event. And having watched Johnny, because I'm a huge fan of Johnny Brownlee, I think when he is on, he's beautiful to watch racing. He can outrun anybody. And he seemed to have that Johnny running legs again. Now, being a sprint distance, I've found that watching Johnny, he seemed to fade a lot later in the runs anyway. So he, he's missing an endurance base from a lot of the other performances he's done. But I think he's a he's a he's he's an athlete, a confidence athlete. And after that race, I think he'll build. It's perfect timing. He's going into his home race in Leeds next week. I just I'm, I'm stoked to see him back on the top in the top step. It was just wonderful to see the Brownleys back together again. Even though Alistair was really in there to push Bishop on that um, on that um, bike ride to try and get those points. And even though Tom crashed at the top of the climb, he did an Annie Emerson crashing on the on the climb. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but it was just great to see the Brownleys back in in the field. And I think Johnny rises when. When, when his brother's with him. Maybe I'm, I'm over-analyzing things, but he just seems to be a lot more relaxed racer. And he was it wasn't just winning the race. He was he was setting the pace. He was very, very dominant during the entire race, so from swim all the way through. So it was, it was really, really good. And, uh, you know, kudos to him. Very, very good to watch. Yeah, Annie, what, what did you think as well? Because I know you know Johnny well, and he's a very, very popular figure um, amongst World Triathlon and all the other athletes. We're very happy to see him do the job. I mean, maybe not Adrian Brifford, but everybody else. Oh, I, I was really happy for him. And I think, you know, I don't know if there's stuff missing in his training or if he's changed something, but my gut feeling is, like listening to that post-race interview um, where he kind of said, you know, if you'd asked me a few hours ago what I thought about Tokyo, I would have, like, you know, I wouldn't have been very happy because he's lost so much confidence and he needed that race. You know, he'll have his feet on the ground. He knows that the, you know, that the guys weren't all there. There was a lot of guys missing, but the fact that he was able to beat Blumenfeld and Mola and really deliver on the day, as you said, and, and I love those courses. I miss those courses. You know, the ones that are really tough, that break up. He came out of the swim. He was on fire out of the swim straight up that hill. No one could stay with him. Um, he looked absolutely brilliant. But it's interesting to hear about the fact that even though Alistair, you know, wasn't in the pack with him because he was helping bring Tom up, and we can talk about that in a minute. I have touched base with Tom and found out a little bit about what went on. But um, he said at the end that Alistair was out on the course. And with one kilometre to go, he said that Alistair shouted out to him, when you go, make sure you mean it. And he said, oh, I made sure I did. So it's almost like he needed Alistair even, you know, just there, his presence on the course, knowing that he was there, you know, gave him that extra little kind of, you know, whatever he needed to, to break away from the Swiss athlete. He was having a great race, but, you know, Johnny needed to be preferred. He really did. And he did it in great style and convincingly. And I think it's great boost for, for the team. We still don't have a third slot. But anyway, Johnny's on form and, you know, that's great news. Yeah, absolutely. And, and as you mentioned, I mean, no disrespect to Adrian Brifford, but he did run away from Mario Mola and he ran away from Christian Blumenfeld. And, and, and those two have their own stories to tell. And we're going to hear from Christian Blumenfeld later on in the show. Maybe three weeks in a row is too much for him, even though he's probably the man who could do it three times if he really... Has he been four weeks in a row as he raced? Next weekend as well. <laughs> oh, yeah. Four, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got another one yeah. coming up. Uh, why not? He's doing the Tom Bishop. He's doing the tour. He's doing the whole lot. Um, but good to see Mario Mola, who we haven't really mentioned much in this um, podcast over the last six weeks, um, come back to form and, and look a bit more like he does. He really had a really good run um, to run himself into third, and he was probably 10 seconds off the pace. But he's a guy that obviously is a three-time world champion that we I kind of just got lost in the mix a little bit with other people as they've been uh, doing the job over the last couple of weeks. But uh, Mola, very special athlete, and and you know he's going to come on at the right time when it counts and be there or thereabouts. Um, I mean, Maka, let's start with you. I mean, we've had him in Super League. Um, he's just the most lovely human being, uh, and and it's good to see him have one of those Mario runs that he that he has. Well, we all know he's when he's on, he's the best runner in the game, and uh, I, I think 
the advantage Mario's had, and I may be wrong, I do. I think he's already pre-selected for the games on the Spanish side, so he's already in the team. Is that correct? So I, I think he's been able to relax and, so, yeah. and build through to Tokyo. So he's using these races without any urgency to be selected in teams or anything. He's he's able to, and you're seeing his progression on, on these races. And he's finally jumped back on top of the podium. I think he looked better over the sprint distance. He's been doing a lot of base and uh, following a lot with Jake Bertwistle and 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 the guys that are all training down there, Vincent and Mario. They're doing a lot of volume, so he's come off that, had a great race, and will go back into camp. I, I just, I, I think there's a lot more improvement as you start to taper off Mario. I don't even think, you know, any of that racing is in his brain at the moment. It's more about getting that volume and getting that work done before you start to back off for Tokyo. So, yeah, he's he's closing the gap on his competitors, and we talked about last week maybe Christian Blumenfeld showing too much of his hands early, and and now the guys seem to be closing those gaps and. It's going to be interesting these next 55 days or 60 days, however it is, until the games and, and what athletes do. And I'm really, really keen on Leeds because I do believe the Leeds race, a lot of people are targeting that race because there's so much on the line on Olympic selection and it being really the last big major hit out outside of Hamburg, but the last major hit out that you'll focus on prior to the Olympics. Yeah, does it does Leeds change in complexion now because of the Olympics? Um on the, I mean, because some people, obviously, people are racing for different reasons. Or do you just race this race as it is because it's such an important part of the championship series anyway? I mean, what do, you, what is it going to, how is it going to be different, or is it not going to be any different? Because obviously, the start lists are fantastic. And well, Tim, what do you think? You know, I don't think it will be any different. The top athlete, Moller's not racing Leeds actually, or he's not on the start list. But I think. Um... You know, I think the top athletes, if they're turning up to a, uh, a, um, a top top tier race, they're not doing it as training. They're doing it tapered and they might be not not in top tip top shape that they're going to be in August, but they're going to be wanting to podium, wanting to show what they've done. You know, you saw Mola race last weekend and th- then he back, it was in Lisbon, I think, and in an ETU Cup and then he raced and he didn't do it as well. So he's definitely coming up. One thing that worried me about Mola was he lost 28 seconds in the swim mm-hmm. and over 750. That is a lot, you know. And and as Johnny said, Johnny was so aggressive out the bike, and I thought, oh, with Fabian there, Varga, you know, it was like the old boys getting back together. You know, I thought those yeah. guys could have taken like the women's race eight to 12 away, and it didn't happen. But Mola is, is early enough out with the squad he's got that Mola can address certain things that need to be addresses and also tick the box. His running is where it needs to be. On any given day, you know, third, first, you know, there were second, seconds in it. Annie, what, what are your thoughts on, on where Mario Mola is? Because obviously Christian Blumenfeld showed his hand and some other people have as well. And he just it's ominous. He's just building, isn't he? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, a really tricky time for him. You know, make no bones of it. You know, he'll be building towards Tokyo, but he doesn't want to finish third in a race, right? He, he really doesn't. And and I, I thought at one point he was he was really running them down, but at the end, when when Johnny pulled away, I don't think Mola had anything to answer. With he, he's sitting out of leads, and I don't think it's it's a race that he's ever been that interested in racing. I don't think we've ever seen him there. Maybe once before. He's certainly not been on the podium in leads. Um, and I'm with Tim on the swim being a bit worrying. But then when an athlete is tired, you know, and they're not a specialist swimmer, they're not going to swim as well. But I think you're absolutely right to have lost 28 seconds and 750 metres is way too much. What is it, eight weeks out or something to Tokyo? But, you know, he's under a great coach and I'm, I'm sure they've got something up their sleeve. You know, he's a great athlete. So, uh, yeah, and the run seems to be coming back. So I- I'm pretty sure he will feature. I thought the swim in that race, watching it, was very, very rough to the first boy. It looked like everybody was congested. So he could have easily been caught out because I thought yeah. blooming. Both. It's usually the weaker swimmers that get caught out because I was always in that position. Yeah, When it's so so aggressive to that first can and everyone gets around, the weaker swimmers tend to get shelled to the back. And once you move off that can and they're swimming the, those gaps open. So I do agree it is concerning at that type of distance. And we know that is the weakness for Mario. And uh, he'll need to fix that come Tokyo. And yeah, the swim was really choppy. Everyone was talking about it, obviously, with the wind. And that beach start, it's yeah. not as, you don't get in your stroke. Like you dive in, you swim. When you're running in, if he was a step behind someone, plus the choppiness, you know, and it was tight, 60, yeah. 63, 65 men to the first boy in a sprint race, that's going to be some tight swimming. But I mean, still, I mean, he's there or thereabouts. And that's, this time of year, that, that, that's where you need to be. You know, he's not, not a million miles off you know, like some of the other athletes are. 
like the defending Olympic champ. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and, and let's talk about that because um, AB, JB and TB are all battling for position three. That's Ali and Johnny Brownlee and Tom Bishop. And Tom uh, <laughs> pulled a huge Annie and, uh, and fell off on the hill. And then Alistair, uh, being the selfless guy that he is, because... <laughs> Tom's actually working for Alistair to help Alistair get to the Olympics, stopped and tried to go back and help him. Um, but let's just say that overall, it is not going well for Team GB, AB, JB or TB. Um, and they're doing the battle with USA. Obviously, Morgan Pearson's Yokohama third didn't help. Um, and Tom needs to be in the top 30. And he's not in the top 30. He's 35th going in. He's still 35th. What, I mean, what, what it, it now comes down to Alex Yee or Alistair Brownlee. And because it did not go well. I mean, is that where we're at at this point, Macca? I know you're following this quite quite closely. Yeah, look, I, I I'm still hopeful, and it will be at the expense of the Australians. I don't. I'm not all over the points, but I've been reading a whole bunch of the tweets that everyone's been putting out and trying to go through all the all the the possibilities to get spots. And it looks like it's Aaron Royal they have to dismiss on points to take that third spot. So one part of me is like. Mm-hmm. Tough luck. Hope the UK misses that with my Australian passport. I, I, I have that. But I, I would like to see Alistair Brownlee in the Olympic Games. I think I think for Johnny's sake, he brings a lot to the team. So I think if they could get that third spot, it'd be great. But it is it is unlikely. But, um, yeah, Alistair, as you said, I think uh, he raced for that third spot with Tom. And uh, I think post Leeds will probably get more of a feel on where his headspace is. Or he may have that right now, whether he thinks it's a possibility or not. But... Um, I think, you know, you keep the hope alive and, and, and you push forward. I, I, I think it would be a, a disappointment for fans of triathlon, you know, and I selfishly with, wish they could just put him in the Olympics as a defending champion, but the Olympics doesn't work like that. But as a fan of triathlon, I think it would be, it would be sad to have Alistair Brownlee in the Olympic Games for the first time in the last three Olympics. You know, it's, uh, it, 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 I think he brings a lot to the British team, whether he races a relay or not. And I think he brings a lot to Johnny and could bring a lot to, to Alex if Alex was in the team to close any gaps if Alex had an issue in the swim to put him in the position to win the race. But we know that if Alistair Brownlee's at the Olympics, Alistair Brownlee isn't riding for anyone else except Alistair Brownlee. So it is, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting times. I would never have picked that had you asked me in 2018 who the British Olympic team was going to be. Alistair Brownlee would have definitely been on my, mm. my list of selected athletes. Yeah, absolutely. What about what about you, Annie? What are your thoughts there? I mean, it, does, if it comes down to a straight shootout between Alex and Alistair, I mean, I'm firmly in that they'll pick Alistair Camp because there's just too much riding on it. What about you at this point? Well, oh my goodness me, it is complicated, right? Um, so two things. Um, I, I know that um, poor Tom hit Johnny's wheel, um, Alistair's wheel going uphill. Can you imagine that? Yes. Um, he just said it was schoolboy error, touched his wheel, and he was down. So it's nothing more than that. Um, Alistair, why didn't he finish the run? Like, wouldn't he have you thought eight weeks out or whatever it is that you would want a hard run in your legs, even if you're running for 40th? You know, you've flown all the way to Italy. So, uh, you know, the question is, where is his run at, you know, in terms of niggles mm. and stuff? So, you know, I don't know. Uh, you would have ran right. He would have done 5K, I think. He, he wasn't just there to stand on the sidelines and support Johnny at that point. Johnny knows what he's got to do. So there's that question. There's, do you put him in? to Because let, let's say his run is not going to be where it needs to be to help Johnny, because we can see how Johnny is buoyed by Alistair being in any race. Or do we just say, sod it, we have to leave, you know, the two times Olympic champion out and put Yi in in case it comes down to a running race. It's so hard, isn't it? It really is. You can see how both ways, you know, and we need that third slot. The one thing I would say is if Tom goes, he has had a brilliant race in Leeds before where he finished, I think it was six. I know it was well inside the top 10. If he goes out there and smashes the race out of his life, can he shift himself up into the 20s and we get the third slot? I think, no, Tim's shaking his head. No. <laughs> Tim is shaking his head. It's, it's a tough call, right? I think um, he needs a 15th at Leeds or better, and then he needs to go to Mexico and get an eight. So Tom needs to do a lot to do that. And, you know, he didn't do so well, was it in Lisbon and obviously Yokohama, and then, you know, the accident here. He's on the back foot and, you know, it's fantastic to see Alistair helping him, but is it a little, little 
too little, too late. You know, should they have should they have done the maps and helped him at some of the races that did happen last year? Um, so I don't think we're going to get the third spot. I think the Aussies are safe. So you guys will be be happy about that. And then you've got the do you pick Alistair or Alex? And I noticed I follow the old social media. Johnny and Alistair, every Tuesday evening, they put a great social post and they look beautiful running on the running track with all their mates. Track Tuesday. Alistair has not put a track Tuesday. But Alistair has not posted a track Tuesday their whole time when they were at altitude. And was that because he wasn't on the track, because he couldn't be on the track? Or was it because he was doing stealth training and amazing training? I hate to say it. I don't know if he's got a niggle and if he's not maybe running at the moment. Do you pick an athlete over someone who's performing like Alex with the hope that he pulls himself round? Do you give him a date? By this date, you need to do X to prove your race, your run fitness. Um, but then does he go and try and win leads for himself? But then by doing that, he could lose a third spot or does he try and help Tom? Then does he fly to Mexico? It's, um, yeah, I would not want to be in the British selector's position right now. Yeah, with the, with the pressure from UK sport, plus the pressure from the athletes. We know Ali and Johnny are really strong within the federation. And then you've got Alex Yee, who all he's doing is the best he can do, which is bloody world-class racing, which is fantastic to see. I say so give the young you, kid if, a chance. If, you, if, uh, if Alistair was to win Leeds, do you think he puts himself on the Olympic team and they drop Yee? Because in, in my opinion... There's a lot of risk because I, I tend to agree. I, I'm not sure where that injury issue is with Alistair Brownlee, and I agree with Annie. The fact, if you are building towards the Olympics and you are thinking, okay, you do run on the weekend, you, 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 you unleash that fight, okay, you use that run, you go back to camp. Yes. And unless you have a, a slight niggle and you are nursing that and you don't want to show that, so I don't know whether the Federation is aware there's a niggle or it's something you keep to yourself and you say nothing. And in my head, there's a lot of risk if if he does, if he is carrying an injury because it's not just the individual race now that we've always had an Olympic Games there's a team team race there and you and with only two in the British team both those athletes are racing the relay so they're they're being selected for two races so it's a lot of risk if you're carrying an injury to take that across the team and affect your three other teammates so in my head the safe play is Alex Yi and, and that's how, very very tough to say against a two-time defending Olympic champion but. Yeah, you have to pick Yee unless Alistair was to go and dominate Leeds and push Yee out of the equation and say, put his hand up and go, I'm ready. Give me my start. I'll be Leave me alone. I'll be ready for Tokyo. I think that that's sort of the only playing card that Alistair Brownlee has left, in my opinion. He should have been putting up Track Tuesdays. I agree. But like Track Tuesdays, <laughs> but old photos. Or like putting him, like Photoshopping himself in. <laughs> Or like just putting his head on Johnny and just like, or just, or just like staging it so they've all got to be in a pose and take the photo real quick. This is all about smoke and mirrors. It's fun, like you're right though, you can't. I just... could be wrong. I could be wrong. <laughs> but why fly to why fly to Italy the week before Leeds in your home race and not do the run? Yeah, you know, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Really interesting. Uh, let's quickly talk about Christian Blumenfeld. Got, um... uh, oh, sorry. Carry on. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, and then, like, you still got the reserve. Whoever is the British reserve could still do the relay. So do you pick Alistair as a reserve to do the team relay to get a medal? But how many relays has he done? Gordon Benson, he's won the Olympic test, silver at the Olympic test event in the relay. He just got six at Lisbon. He is a really, really good relay racer. He's strong, big bugger, real powerful. Like, who would you pick for a relay? Alistair? or Benson, or someone else. I don't know. <laughs> but that's not our problem. <laughs> no, it's not. This is not our problem. It's we just, we're here to engage in wild speculation and nothing more. Um, now, very quickly uh, on Christian Blumenfeld, because we're about to speak to him. Uh, we're about to speak to Christian. Uh, you know, second, third week in a row, ends up with seventh, doesn't have the legs on the run, but puts himself in the position anyway, uh, which in itself on the third week in a row off the back of two wins is impressive. Um, don't know whether it's the smartest thing to do, but Macker, I know that you've spoken about Team Norway before and about how they've they've um, planned for this. They know exactly what they're doing. Um, so Christian hasn't burned all his matches, uh, but he was there or thereabouts until the second half of the run and then got dropped off the back, but so did you know, so did Mario Mola. So we can't put too much stock in that, but... Geez, he's had a, had a month, hasn't he? 
Oh, he's had a he's had an incredible month, and again, this was only a sprint race. We're not talking Olympic distance racing, which I do think Christian runs better over that ten k distance. But he got the legs run off him. He lost thirty seven seconds to Johnny in that run. He never looked comfortable running out of transition. He he tried to get that momentum of his going, and he just got gapped relatively quickly. So there's definitely fatigue there. He is human. I I, I don't think he's had a wonderful race ever in Leeds. I'm, I stand to be corrected, but I remember for years expecting him to do well in Leeds. And I've never seen a big performance. Out of, so it's not a course that I may be corrected that he's very, very good at. I know Johnny's very good on the course. I know the English love that course. So I I, I think we're going to see him race as hard as he can in, in Leeds. It'll be a, a, a showing point on just where he stands. We know he's in good form, but just how he stands off a block of four races. Then there'll be the big prep for him going into, into Tokyo. But for, for the Norwegians, racing four weeks in a row means nothing. It's just a hard session. These guys just pin a number on and they've run a long run in the north. They're, they're ludic. They're, they're insane. But uh, got, <laughs> their one focused is Tokyo. And I, I, I'm still going to back the entire planning of that Norwegian team. It's been flawless up until now. Let's crack straight into it, actually. Let's go to Christian right now. I'm going to catch up with him uh, and hear what he had to say uh, off the back of that uh, third week of racing in a row. Cool, man. Thanks for doing this for me. Appreciate it. Yeah, nice to be on the show. Yeah, cool. All right, let's crack on to it. Christian, welcome to the Short Shoot Show. Um, what a three weeks it's been for you, mate. It's been fantastic to watch, fantastic to, uh, to see what's been going on. How are you feeling physically, first of all? Because it's been what I imagine is a tough three weeks of travel, hotel rooms, uh, isolation, and then uh, really hard races. Well, right now I feel actually quite good. Uh, I felt quite flat in the body last week leading into the race. And then uh, I wasn't really sure how we would be going on in the race. Unfortunately, I didn't have the last bit of uh, kind of uh, energy to be in the mix in the end on Saturday. But uh, hopefully it will be going a little bit better in, uh, in Leeds next week. But for sure, it's been a good three weeks and uh, I really enjoyed Yokohama and uh, Lisbon. So, uh, yeah, a good start of the season. Yeah, I can imagine you did really enjoy Yokohama and Lisbon because you're absolutely dominant, dominated. Big win at Yokohama, first of all. Of course, that's the championship series one. Talk us through through that race because, you know, you had some big runners there in Alex Yee and Yella Gaines and Jonas Schomburg and you just... You just broke them in that Christian Blumenfeld way that you do. Uh, yeah, you know, the first race of the season, you really don't know where everyone else is. And uh, especially with the kind of the strange build up with being in the kind of in, in the bubble, just doing inside training. And uh, you just kind of have to trust the training you have done leading into the race. And um, I felt... I was happy with my swim close enough to the first pack and uh, was straight away in kind of a good position on the bike. And I tried to play my card right and wait until that uh, final 10 K and uh, yeah, I had like felt quite good on the whole run and uh, just counting down the laps and uh, with two K to go, it was down to me and Yella and, um, yeah, I was quite happy to be able to <laughs> take the win. And uh, uh, especially also with the running time we did, I think it was maybe the fastest run time we've done in Yokohama since we did this course since 2017. So that's also kind of a confident booster that uh, my run shape is um, uh, on track for uh, Tokyo. Yeah, and then of course Super League Triathlon, which is the main racing this year. I mean, there's a small Tokyo race and then bang, we're into the big stuff. But get like I can't understand. Like, I don't understand you, right? And this is why I don't understand. It's because you look like you are in the utmost pain at all times, right? You got this face like ah, as you go, and then afterwards you're like, oh, I felt completely comfortable during that entire run. So what? What is it? Which one is it? With the entire run, I, I didn't feel confident like the last two k. That was um, kind of all out sprinting but until that point it was more like okay just waiting until that last lap waiting until that last lap and um, uh, but of course you, you don't want to show that you're feeling great necessarily to the people around you you maybe want to um, uh, 
let them believe that you are struggling a little bit because then it's easier that they will kind of try to drop you and kind of just actually just leading uh yeah taking the win and making them uh, suffer until uh, before the last lap all right so you just you feel like completely comfortable and then you're like you know what i'll put on my my christian face like <laughs> yeah just to throw them off you're like you look over at yellow and you're like Ah, oh, oh, it's really hard. <laughs> Whilst you're completely normal, I like it. I like what you're doing there. You do it a lot, but that and I, for me, it shows me that you don't want to get caught in a sprint. You just there's times during these runs, it looks like you're really up the pace and just try and just try and break people. Like in Lisbon, you start off with five, and then you're shaking them off one by one, and then middle of the run, there was this time when you're like, oh, I've got to get rid of Max Studer, and you just you just pushed. It just seemed like there were times when you just pushed a little harder and tried to drop them off. Is that? Am I correct? Yeah, I think um, if you are five guys in a group, it would be stupid if everyone was waiting until that last hundred meter. You know, that's just going to suit one of the five. So uh, I know that I don't have the speed to go for the last hundred, two hundred, or three hundred meters. So I I have to go earlier and. Um, I think like between four and one K to go is kind of a, a good place to do it because then you are still off. It feels like you are a long way from home and it's quite hard mentally to push that hard. And um, yeah, I think I have, I'm fast enough to go with two K to go and also have the endurance and I can back it up and uh, both in uh, Lisbon and Yokohama, it worked quite well. Unfortunately, I failed here in Italy on Saturday on that last lap. But um, yeah, I need I need to yeah. go before that blue carpet. I want to win a race. Johnny Johnny set a pretty Johnny set a pretty tough tough pace out there. I mean, I mean, he's a, he's a popular guy. I mean, it must have been good. I mean, obviously you want to win that one, but it's good to see Johnny get one, and he he really pushed the pace hard there, and he ended up thirty seconds or more back. So. There was no problem there. You just didn't have it in the tank. Uh, yeah. Or well, I tried to go with them uh, going into that last lap, and I was at one point in the third position. But from there, I just went backwards. And um, when Mario passed me, and I realized that okay, the podium is kind of out of the picture now. Then I also had the leads in my mind, and uh, I thought, okay, just get comfortable into the finish line and uh, get ready for next weekend. Uh, you you do want to kind of find that balance between uh, giving it a try, but also not uh, dying for that fifth place or fourth place when I saw that the, the podium was out of the picture. So hopefully I will be able to recover and uh, be uh, ready for another fight on Sunday. Yeah. We've we've spoken on the podcast. I mean, even last week about maybe you show you're peaking too early or showing your hand too early because you see a guy like look at you smiling because you're like I have a plan. I have a plan. This is the plan. You re- you heard it? Yeah, yeah I heard it. But uh, no, it's uh, it's not like uh, I think it's good to do like a, a month of racing. And uh, I think what most people don't really understand is that uh, it's actually harder to be one month uh, in altitude and doing the training compared to racing back to back because now we have like uh, one tough day every seventh day and uh, it's actually easier than um, uh, uh, yeah being up in altitude and doing tough sessions every second day Uh, of course you have to be feeling fresh when you're racing, but uh, in between that, you're just recovering and trying to get ready for another weekend. Yeah, I suppose when you, you pit like a you know an hour's effort in Sardinia versus you know the standard Christian Blumenfeld thirty kilometer uphill run wearing a fifty kilogram pack or whatever it is you, you mad Norwegians are doing, it's probably like a holiday for you. I mean, look at you with your lovely little bed. You're sitting on the bed, you're relaxing, you've probably only done six hours of training today. It's really relaxed, mate. Yeah, so now, yeah, as I say, and also I was, I'm expecting to kind of bounce back from a racing when I'm doing like uh, an hour or two hours half of hard effort in a week. And I'm ex- expecting that like three, four days later, I will be kind of recovered and even in better shape because normally I respond quite well to high intensity like this. So it's been kind of 
a part of the plan to do one month of racing back to back. And um, that's also how the Super League season is going to be now with uh, four weekends in a row with uh, back to back racing, which is uh, quite nice to see. It's going to be uh, about who, who can actually recover between each uh, weekend and also being um, able to time it. So you're feeling fresh for the race day on either Saturday or Sunday. And you can have like a downtown uh, downtime um, from Monday to Friday and time it good. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, I'm not going to say that you're doing this month so that you're prepared for Super League because there is a small race in between that you might want to win. But what what learnings can you take away from from racing every weekend for a month that you could put in place? You think you've taken something that you could learn there and go, oh, this is how I'm going to operate in that month of Super League. Well, you need to know how to time it with uh, kind of uh, how you're responding on the training because uh, the worst thing you want to do is feeling great Wednesday and Thursday and then pushing hard in training and then you come to the weekend and then you feel kind of uh, maybe you over push it a little bit earlier, a few days earlier. So you want to have a kind of a good start, uh, racing well on the first race and then having the confidence that you can actually recover midweek and... Uh, feeling uh, not 100% and then uh, you will be ready again for um, another race on either Saturday or Sunday and kind of having that kind of we're peaking for the weekend and then having uh, being confident to recover midweek. You haven't had, let's go back to the WTCS, you haven't had amazing results in Leeds. Uh, they're, they're changing the course this year, so it's slightly different, but you did come sixth uh, for maybe four years ago now. Uh, which is the best by quite a distance. Does the course not suit you, uh, the, the conditions? I mean, what, what is it about Leeds that um, you do like or you don't like? What I, first of all, like in Leeds is uh, normally the atmosphere, you know, with hundreds of thousands of people sharing on. It's in the hometown to Ali and Johnny, which makes it even more motivating to be able to stand up to stand on the top of the podium there. And, yeah. The, the course is really tough and challenging. It's uh, very technical and it's quite hilly on the run as well. So if you are feeling flat after the bike, it's a really tough run course to get through because it's hilly all the time. It's either uphill or downhill. So uh, it's for sure a course where you want to feel good. And um, But this time, it's gonna, I think it's going to be in the park. Everything going to be like uh, a little bit like we did in Hamburg where it's like outside of the downtown and uh, it's going to be, I think it's going to be a hilly course again because we do that kind of the hill that we do out of transition. We're going to do that on each lap, I think, and also maybe once on the run. So it's going to be a tough course. Hopefully it will be some people there sharing on. I'm not sure what the rules are at the moment, uh, but um, I think uh, it's good to have it over an Olympic distance and uh, the final prep before the Olympic Games. What what what's going on with your with your Kona tilt? Is is it on this year? What's what's the situation here? Because you just you're a racing machine. So any like, and I've seen your race schedule. It's just like three times as long as everybody else's. So so where's your aim here for? Because you've got Super League triathlon. Then what happens? Well, I would like to see if it's possible to win the Olympics and Kona in the same year. And Gustav, he's already qualified for uh, Kona since he won in this uh, two years ago now. So uh, I would like to give it a try and show the long distance guys that um, then maybe need a little bit more speed if they want to be up there in the future <laughs> in the Ironman distance. And also it's, it's good prep for the sub seven to be have done uh, an Ironman distance uh, before that race as well. Yeah, I think you probably want to do at least one actual Ironman before you try to be the fastest ever Ironman that's ever competed. But so when when do you fit in? Because you, you haven't been ratified yet. You haven't. When, when do you fit in an Ironman between now and Kona? Because Kona is a week a week after Super League. What's going on, I man? I haven't set the schedule yet, so I'm not really sure how it's going to be. And you know. Uh... A lot of races can be either postponed or cancelled, or so I have to be quite flexible there. But I think uh, as long as I just put my name up to an Ironman race to qualify, I guess the ones who is uh, looking for qualifying themselves, they will find another race to do it. 
So um, it's just going to be, <laughs> it's just going to be like trying to get in qualification done as easy as possible and then uh, uh, be ready for October, I think. So, so it's going to be the Olympics, then you're going to find an Ironman race, enter it, scare off everyone else who's trying to qualify, win that or whatever, then do Super League, then go to Kona. Yeah, basically. So it's it's going to be, it's going to be uh, a lot of racing uh, after the Olympics as well. So even though it's going to be quite busy now, with the next uh, year it's going to be even more busy with racing and traveling. So uh, hopefully the world will open up a little bit more so it's easier to travel because at the moment it's uh, quite stressful with all the paperwork and the testing that we have to do to get around. But um, yeah, it will be good to get the, the race the season starting again. It wasn't too many races last year, so I have to catch up a little bit. <laughs> yes, by doing the most intense short course <laughs> racing, followed by the most intense long course racing and adding the Olympics as well. So Olympic distance, then to an Ironman, then to Super League, then to Ironman again, and then we've got Sub 7, and you mentioned that before. How are you feeling about that? It's obviously you know been out there in the public domain for a little while. Um, I know you're a, you're a confidence man. You think that you know that the people who do long course are slow, and that you're going to show them. You know, you st- you're still feeling that confidence. I mean, you should be. You're on top of the world in short course right now. Yeah, I think it's going to be good. Uh, they just uh, announced like the rules with the domestic riders for sub seven. We can have ten guys helping us across swim, bike, and run in total. And uh, uh, I think. It's all about finding a strong team as possible for that bike section. And now as we will have, um, I think we're looking at having it on like a small circuit so we can actually uh, swap riders on the bike quite often. It will make it more doable actually, because then the riders that is helping me can actually overpace. So they don't have to do like one pace for four hours. They can kind of be in there for 20 minutes and then change again. So that's going to make a huge difference uh, in terms of uh, which kind of riders I'm looking at. And for the run and on the swim, I think it's maybe just one guy I would have in front of me. Uh, like, and, and that's not going to be too difficult to find because the pace isn't that high on the swim and on the, on the run compared to what's required on the bike. Having said that, you're still going to need to lay down an, a, a marathon faster than anyone in any Ironman has ever yeah. done. It's going to be like a 220 or 225, I guess. And <laughs> and the thing is, uh, when, when you're trying to kind of uh, plan the race and calculate everything, you can't just uh, go for a uh, 659 something because then I guess it will be behind Alistair. So we have to put in like a margin there where I actually have something left in the tank where I can go below if necessarily. So, uh, uh, but I think uh, it's all about being as efficient as possible going into transition two. So you have uh, enough energy left to go, uh, yeah, down to 220 maybe for that run. Is there any uh, tactics or tech or anything you can let us in on or even better? Have you got a pacemaker you can reveal for us? Have you got anyone already you can say you're locked in? Uh, not really. But, uh, yeah, we are working on kind of having that uh, uh, technology on our side. So we are about to develop uh, some new gears that we'll be using for the race. But it's not official yet. It's coming. It's more to come. I look forward to hearing all about that. Christian, thank you so much for your time. Good luck in Leeds. Uh, it's a packed start list. Um, it's obviously a big, big race, uh, not only just on its own, but also for people to show where they're up to uh, coming into the Olympics. And there's plenty who are tipping you. You've had an amazing month. Keep it going. And thanks for joining us on the Short Shoot Show. Thank you very much. All right. There was Christian Blumenfeld. Um, what a race that guy is and what an asset he is to, to triathlon. He really brings something a little bit different. Let's go on to the women's uh, racing now. As I said, no Flora Duffy, no Brit women racing, no US women racing. Uh, Italy's Vera Steinhauser was the top finisher from last year. She took the bronze. Um, how did it go? Uh, Vittoria Lopez uh, was first out of the water. The Brazilian 
The bike took its toll, though. It's a 17% gradient at one point on that hill, and so you'd expect it to take its toll. A uh, group of a dozen on the bike was down to nine by the end. Julie Derren of Switzerland uh, was first out. And how about Marlene Gomez Islinger, who I have actually never heard of before. Uh, I'll, expl- um, I'll admit to that. Uh, best was ninth in a World Cup. Time to run to perfection. Uh, ran down Audrey Merle, then ran down uh, Darren just inside of the blue carpet. Took her first World Cup win, so congratulations to her. And Tim, yes. you've got the scoop on what she was doing in the week lead up. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, no, so the week lead up, the Germans had a secret squirrel team relay selection race stroke procedure. Um, she was very happy with her performance there. She didn't let any let anything on. Does look like they're really focusing on the routine relay because a medal is a medal. Um, you know, maybe they don't think they've got any women specifically that can really, you know, fight for, for a medal in the individual. Um, and she's going on to Leeds, but she's, um, yeah, that's the best race of her career. And it looked like in the team relay as well. So whatever she's changed, maybe she was training for sprint Olympic distance. And now she's training for super sprint. And that's really helped her sprint distance. Maybe Leeds will be a bit long, a bit tough for her. But yeah, I, I, I think we're going to see her in Tokyo. And, you know, if the Germans turn up, you know, with the, the, the depth of the men as well, they're going to have a, a really good relay team. So um, yeah, that's exciting. Not many Germans on the start list, um, men-wise, in Leeds. And there's only one Viking, only one Norwegian, only Christian. He's the only guy racing. Um, I think he might not even race. I, I don't know. We'll see. Well, and what's the point, really? He's already done all he can do, uh, I suppose. But uh, how about you, Annie, watching the, the women's race? Um, tough to watch Darren lead the whole run and then be beaten inside of the blue carpet because she really took it out um, on the run early doors. Um, but a, a great race by by the German and um, just, yeah, gutsy off the back of racing on a Wednesday. Absolutely. Um, I think that the Swiss athlete, um, just to mention, she's another athlete coming out of the Brett Sutton camp um, from Switzerland. So uh, I, I touched base with him and he said, yeah, she's kind of going from strength to strength. So, and I think it was probably really disappointing. She, she, she was running very well. Uh, just to pick up on Marlene there, she... She's an interesting one. I, I saw a result from hers in the Czech Republic race last year that, um, was it, was it the back end of last year that Georgia Taylor Brown won and Duffy was second? She was, Marlene was way down the field, oh, yeah. but she ran the same time as, uh, Flora Duffy. So she's obviously got the running legs. Um, I think the swim let her down slightly. She was 20 seconds down on the swim in, in Italy at the weekend, but but it was still a great run, and, and she looked like a real champion on the run, didn't she, Mac? I don't know about you, but the running style was absolutely spot on. I think the, the extra distance is going to cost her, and I think she will find Leeds um, a lot harder, quite obviously. Leeds, just to add, Macca, is a different course this year, so they're staying in Round Hay Park. They're not actually going into the city centre. Okay. Um, so it's going to be different. It's all to do with COVID. Um, but it's still going to be a, a really tough, tight course, I think. It might even be a bit tougher. But the course is different in Leeds this year. And I think Marlene, while she had a great race, is going to find it a lot tougher this weekend coming. Yeah, well, my, my takeaway, I, I think, from the women's race, and I saw her run was magnificent to make the pass when it mattered to, to win the event. But I, I, just seem, I just seem to be seeing Swiss athletes everywhere in the recent weeks. They've seemed to come out of the... the whether it's across long distance yeah. racing in the short, and they're all new athletes. You know, you've seen Imogen Simmons just lose on the weekend in challenge race in St. Poulton in Austria. We've got mm-hmm. the Swiss men doing so well across the board, the Swiss women, and there seems to be a lot of them. There's a lot of depth. Daniela Reef winning. So uh, have they got, what's the numbers on the Swiss for Olympic qualification? Are they, are they in the hunt for three spots or is it definitely only two spots on the men and the women's side? Because it'll be interesting to see how that unfolds on their selection because they seem to have a lot of athletes performing at the right time. Yeah, I don't know about that, actually. That's interesting. That's an interesting question. But when you go, you've got Spirig, and I know that we went and shot some content with uh, Nicola Spirig, and she was in uh, Canary Islands and with with Max Studer and Julie Derren, and they all train together, and they go on camps together. They're all Brett Sutton coached. Um, and you're right. They're all – I mean, I yeah, they're all, they're all just – I mean, Max came, what, second in Lisbon. Mm-hmm. And he, he stuck too. He stuck to Blumenfeld in such an impressive run. Uh, and then Darren ran the legs off this race and only got beaten at the death. And then obviously Nicola herself won in Lisbon. And um, 
Yeah, they're on fire, aren't they? The Swiss. That's that's very impressive. That's a good call from you too. Yeah, Briffitt in the men's race. He he's won that race yeah. years ago. They're, they're everywhere, and they seem to be all hitting their strides at the right time. If if any if any nation has handled this pandemic well, they they have from an athletic perspective because they are in form across all distances in triathlon at the moment. Yeah, very true. Very true indeed. Uh, let's let's quickly get uh, before we wrap things up. Leeds predictions. Um, one thing I want to uh, point out is Lucy Charles Barclay is going to finally yeah. race the world the World Triathlon Championship Series, which is outstanding. Um, it's it's been a long time coming. She's done everything else. I mean, she did the British swimming trials for the fifteen hundred. She raced Super League, ended up on the podium there. She's obviously been on the podium plenty of times and always on the second step uh, in Kona. She loves a challenge, uh, and this will be another one. And you know, she's just going to take that race uh, by the scruff of the neck and leave everything out there. Uh, and she joins a, a group of British women, Non Stanford, Vicky Holland, Jess Learmouth, Georgia Taylor Brown, Sophie Cowell, Beth Potter, Olivia Mathias. Um, it's going to be quite the field. Uh, Tim, what you know? What do you think about Lucy? I mean, coming coming from long course and then just taking on all these challenges, and then the next one. Uh, she only got the call the other day uh, when she was um, down in Lanzarote, and here she is. She's going to lead. I love it. I bloody love it. I think she's going to smash it up. Um, I seriously do. Um, I think she definitely knew a few weeks ago. If you if you look at her training, her training's been geared towards short course um, for a while now. Um, but I just think she's going to come out that swim with Jess. And if Flora can hang on on the swim or bike up early on in the bike, um, the three of them could have a couple of minutes. Yeah. It's going to be like the old Barb Lindquist, Loretta Harrop show. Um, and as you said, she's so she's so gutsy. She's so tough. You know, Jess is coming off an injury, um, running injury. Um, I'm going to say it. I think she's going to win wow. Leeds. Wow. That's a huge call. Huge call. Yeah, I, I, huge call. I, I'm ex- yeah, but why not? Yeah, I, you know, what a feel too. <laughs> I think she's going to do – I think she's going to she's oh. going to play a major impact on in, in this race. I think, yeah, I, I, exactly what you said. I just saw a Sheila Tormina, Barb Lindquist – front group again you know the old days of triathlon when that group will get away and they're all going to be english and they're going to work well together she's magnificent oh, with flora duffy obviously in there as well but they, they i just don't think she's going to have the run speed but i love to be corrected because i think it, it, it'd be a great statement to see an iron woman come down in distance no one's ever been able to do it come down in distance they say once you go up you're there for good and there's no coming back and i would just love to see that turn on its head because she's such an exciting athlete to race she's such a breath of fresh air in in triathlon and uh and we've never she she's she's entered our sport completely different to to most people she just went straight in at ironman you know she we've never we've never seen a progression through these shorter races she has the swim to be competitive uh, she's going to lead this swim and set a tempo that could put a lot of other athletes on the back foot from the onset. She'll be aggressive on the bike. She has the bike strength and she's a rhythm runner. So if she gets enough of a gap, I think she's capable of finishing in that in that top five. Whether she can win it, it's a great call, Tim. I'm happy to take a lazy wager on it. And I hope she does win, but I just think she'll uh she may get outrun just by the just by the experience and speed of, of the other women around her. I feel like this is like a pure happy Gilmore moment where he just comes in and he just hits it straight onto the green, and then he's like, "Do you guys do this all the time? Like, it'll be like that. <laughs> she'll win, will she win world trials. She'll be like, is this what you guys do every week? I mean, why don't you? Why aren't you faster? And it'd be awesome to see, and it'd be it'd be great to see that one, um, Annie. What I mean, obviously, in, in you know, and I heard it said by Tim Hemming actually from Two Twenty Triathlon. He's like, this is the most anticipated debut in the history of world triathlon, and and to be fair, it is. I mean, there's going to be a lot of eyes on her, and it's a very very big race. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is my take on it. Uh, I'm with Mecca. What a, a superb person and athlete. So down to earth. So refreshing. In me- huge engine that she talks about. Um, you know, she probably got that when she was in open water swimming, trying to qualify for the Olympics 2012, 10,000 meter or 10k in the water. She says that the engine was developed very early on. Um, she is going to smash that swim up. She's going to hurt a lot of athletes. And that's a fear for someone like Non Stanford, who's just about there, but not quite there, you know, with that kind of pace. Um, she's going to mm-hmm. smash the swim up. She's not used to riding in a pack. And depending on how many people she's with, uh, that she can take with her on the swim, Duffy, uh, Katie Safiris, if she, you know, if she's back on form again, and Jess, 
if they stick in a small pack, she'll be okay. I think she'll find it hard in a big pack. She's never mm. raced in a big yeah. pack before. She's got the open road to herself. She races like an absolute demon on Swift, but she's never really raced in a pack yeah, before. Good. That's going to be hard. So that's going to be really, really tough. Um, the run legs she won't have yet over 10K. She definitely have them over 5K. I think 10K will be a bit of a stretch. If you're looking at running around about 34 minutes, somewhere like that's going to be a tough course. It's not going to be super fast. So I think she'll have a great race. And I think a top, top 10 performance for her will be a good day. I think what the Brit Tri are doing are looking ahead to 2024. 20, that's what they're looking at. That's why they're bringing her in now and giving her this opportunity early on. And maybe a team relay as well. Have they picked their reserve? Is is non the hundred percent the reserve for Tokyo? I think she'd have to be. I, I think don't know. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Commonwealth yeah. Games next year. Yeah, yeah. It's an interesting one because surely there's like a yeah. there's got to be like a, a a list of people waiting to get into the WTCS racing, and so for Lucy to skirt around that without doing anything to qualify her way into that is that controversial in any way? I mean. Well, that's that's a that's a point. I mean, I'm not sure how it works, but I'm sure that there's there's a list of people who are trying to qualify to get into the championship series, and she's got a golden ticket straight to the top. Does anyone shed any light on that? Yeah, what what? I, yeah, I think that Super League Super League Arena Games gave her a leg up on that one. So I think it's that, thanks to Super League Triathlon Arena Games because they suddenly went, "Holy shit, she can race over short course too." Okay, we know it's completely different, so much faster, so much more intense. But she she was fantastic, you know, and I, I think British Troy just went, wow, she's better than we thought. And we know it's difficult to make that comparison, Olympic distance arena games, but she proved that she can race short and really hard and really well. So I think that gave her a bit of a leg up. I, I don't think if she'd done that event, they would have been putting her in just yet. Maybe I'm wrong, but as you say, always say, well, it's all speculation on this podcast. We're all just kind of... Mm throwing things out there yeah. but I agree I don't know how she got the start because sometimes you can sub someone in so you put um Jonathan in because he's the highest ranked athlete you sub him out and maybe you put someone like myself in you can do that because you're taking him out and I'm replacing him but all our top women are racing so I don't know they haven't subbed get- them out I know if it's your home race yeah. you get maybe an extra good. spot or two to, is it two but I've never seen yeah. how many other eight British women racing I've never seen eight British women on a start list and of that of that quality. Um, so I don't know if the mayor got involved in Leeds, Alistair, and he said put her in. Um, so yeah, I don't know what happened, but I'm glad she's in the I'm glad she's on the start list. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, me too. Um, let's look, before we finish up, I mean, let's how about I just saw this yesterday. Joe Brown, I mean Canada's top female. Yeah, she raced in Lisbon. She just put on Instagram, hey, gang, wanted to share the news. I'm back in America. For those catching up on my last adventures, had a very sore back. Clitor was my muscles. Turns out it was a severe kidney infection. Had a six-day fever. Went to many hospitals. Rode in a few ambulances. Dabbled in a COVID ward. Don't get COVID. Spent a night sleeping in the emergency room. Stayed in isolation in a Portuguese hospital for four days. Had a lot of antibiotics. I am alive. Oh, and I broke my nose as well. And that's... Like, also, hectic story, obviously. Um, glad she's okay. Joe, if you're listening, you, you're one of the greats. I'm glad you're all right. And he's just disappeared. She's just too much for her. Now she's back. Um, but how about just the what athletes have to go through? You don't often see it. You don't often see it. Annie, are you okay? No, I just realized my, my, my battery was about to go. But it's all sorted. It's all sorted. Here we are. I thought I was the chaotic one. I love it. <laughs> I love it. I always thought I was the one was chaotic. Oh, my God. Me. This is wow. <laughs> just bailed in the middle of my soliloquy about Joe Brown. Just just, <laughs> just bailed out. All right, well, it's good to see you back. Good on you, mate. Um, but it, it did bring to a, point to a point to mind and also thinking about Japan and what the athletes have to go through. There's a lot that in, in COVID land that has to happen to make these races happen and the, and the athletes have to go through a lot and there's a lot of being stuck in the room and all that kind of thing. And it, it's a bit of a brave new world. So, I mean, just full credit to the athletes for, 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 for doing this because there's a lot to sacrifice to do that. I mean, pe- athletes like Henry Schoeman have gotten sick I mean, it's it's such a different world, and when you hear stories like that, 
Uh, I mean, well, when Tim and Macca hear stories like that, Annie just left me. But when you do, um, it, it really puts into perspective exactly how <laughs> exactly how um, important it is uh, to have this racing on. We love to talk about it and speculate about it, but they go through a lot. So, um, and as as we all have on this podcast, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, it's been a bit of a technical nightmare, but we've made it in the end. Uh, and episode six is in the books. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Excellent. Love it. Good job.